Just like we did with metals and polymers in our materials chapter, we can study the material properties of organic materials, uh, such as the bones in our body. So bone is a natural composite material, meaning that it has various uh, properties and various elements to its construction. So it consists of a porous framework that's made up of calcium phosphate, and then there are uh, fibers of collagen that are interspersed within it. It's the calcium phosphate that gives the bone its stiffness and its strength, and then it's the collagen that provides flexibility. And so long bones, such as the femur in our upper leg, uh, have a hard outer layer, they have a spongy interior layer, and then a central core of marrow. And so we can see that diagrammed here uh, on the side. So it's the marrow that renews the blood supply and uh, provides other important cells, and again, those outer layers that are providing the strength. So bone is called an anisotropic material, and that means that its properties vary on the orientation. Um, so if you think of uh, wood, for example, um, if, you're, if you've ever had to chop wood for a campfire or anything like that, and you need to split a log, it's much easier to split it in the direction of, uh, that's uh, parallel to the fibers of the wood rather than perpendicular. So that's why chopping down a tree is very difficult, but then splitting the wood once you have that tree chopped down is a little bit easier. So bone functions the same way. So in the vertical direction, the bone is going to be extremely strong. But if you hit it from the side, the uh, properties are significantly different. It's going to be significantly weaker. So there are various scenarios that we have to consider when studying how a bone is going to react. So first off, we could have the local stress that's greater than the yield strength, uh, then the material is going to deform. But if we eventually exceed the ultimate strength, then it's going to break. So we want to think back to our more complicated, more realistic uh, diagram of a stress-strain curve for a material rather than the simplified version that uh, we've generally used. And then, of course, there's the energy component. So if the energy absorbed exceeds the toughness, uh, at, um, then the bone is going to deform. If the energy absorbed exceeds the toughness at uh, the fracture point, uh, then the bone is going to break. And so uh, scenarios one and two are for when the load is applied more slowly. And so for situations when the load is applied quickly, like in a car accident type situation, then it's the toughness criterion that's going to apply. And so in car accidents, most bones are going to fail because of the transverse stress, meaning that uh, we're going to end up hitting in uh, perpendicular to the axis of the bone rather than uh, longitudinally. And we would obviously prefer bones uh, not to deform or break. And so any kind of safety design that we put into a vehicle, uh, especially since that's what we're primarily going to be looking at, uh, we've got to see how we can limit the stress that the bone is going to experience uh, to its elastic yield stress. So, of course, we'd prefer no stress at all. But uh, if uh, we are going to be forced to experience some stress, we want to make sure that it's below that yield stress and then certainly below that ultimate uh, strength, that breaking point. So in front of us here, we see a table that has uh, the material properties of bone in both the longitudinal and in the transverse direction. And so we can see that the elastic yield, Young's modulus, the strain at fracture, the toughness at yield and at fracture are all significantly lower in the transverse direction than in the longitudinal direction. So for the long bones, this is consistently going to be the case. They're much better in performing in that longitudinal direction. So let's go back to the problem that we had studied before, where we have a car that's traveling 30 miles per hour, the 75 kilogram driver, experiences 305 G's. So this is the same scenario that we looked at in our previous notes. And so in this scenario here, the driver's not wearing a seatbelt, unfortunately, and uh, the impact of the crash leads to the forehead uh, crashing into the dashboard. And so the area of contact for the forehead on the dashboard is this nine square centimeters. And so using the, uh, and we're gonna use the transverse properties of the bone, we wanna know if the collision will result in a skull fracture. So since we're uh, impacting uh, transverse to the orientation of the fibers of the bone, uh, it's going to be in this transverse direction. So if we recall to calculate the force uh, that the person is experiencing, we can take the mass of the person, that's 75 kilograms times 
acceleration due to gravity. So we've got our g's and then we can multiply that by the number of g's and if you'll recall that in this circumstance it was that 305 g's as we outlined in the problem statement. And so our ultimate force that we uh, were experiencing was 224,000 newtons. So now we want to figure out what is the stress that the bone is experiencing and how does that compare against uh, the material properties of the bone. So remember stress is force over area and so for the stress we've got our 224,000 newtons that we've calculated and then for the area remember the contact area was going to be this nine square centimeters but of course we have to convert that into meters for our force calculation or our stress calculation so we've got one meter per 100 centimeters and then we're going to have to square that as well so we eventually end up with our 224,000 newtons over 0.000900 square meters and so we eventually end up with an answer of 2.49 times 10 to the 8th uh, pascals, newtons per meter squared. Or if we want to convert that into our appropriate uh, prefix form, so that's going to be 249 megapascals. So that's the stress that our skull, uh, the skull of the person, is going to experience. And so certainly if we compare that against the elastic yield uh, of the bone in the transverse direction, we can see that our person is not going to survive with their skull intact. This is almost certainly going to end up being uh, an accident that's going to result in the death of the passenger or the driver. So um, what we need to do ultimately is find a way that we can reduce this number significantly so that we have a chance of survival. Now that's going to be done through a variety of means. Seatbelt obviously is going to be number one, but we'll study some other elements of uh, automobile design that will help to mitigate the stress that the person experiences and then make the accident hopefully survivable.